Hey there, welcome to a brand new episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in this week's vlog you will see my interview with Jonas Steur about the Estuera classic Tales from the South. But before we start with the interview, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and very important, also make sure to click the bell button because then you will get a notification the next time a new vlog is online. Alright, here it is, the story behind Tales from the South by Estuera, my interview with Jonas Steur. Enjoy! Jonas Steur is a DJ and producer from Belgium, who you might know as the creator of tracks such as Flow, Red Shores, Second Turn, Fall to Pieces and many others. In my previous interview with Jonas, we already spoke about his track Castamara, which was the very first track he released under his own name Jonas Steur. Because of the upcoming 20th anniversary of the Estuera classic Tales from the South, I made a visit to the brand new studio of Jonas to ask him about the story behind this one. Fun fact, Tales from the South has a length of 11 minutes and 11 seconds, which makes it one of the longest tracks Jonas has released so far. Maybe it is a coincidence, but at the moment this interview with Jonas is the longest interview available on my channel. I spoke to Jonas for more than one hour, so make sure to grab a coffee or another drink and enjoy this very detailed interview. My first question to Jonas was if he was inspired by something when he started to work on Tales from the South. Um, yes, actually I was. Um, Tales from the South was uh, made with one purpose to be an Inserve Sunrise track. Um, I'm not like there was a compilation coming I, because I didn't know that they were actually going to continue the series. But, well, uh, as some of the, the viewers of the channel will know, Chesto had pretty great uh, compilation series. Two of them actually, Magic, which was the more uplifting and tech trans stuff, really great. But next to that, he also had the Inserve Sunrise series, which was a pizza trance, a bit more chill, a bit more no building atmosphere, groovy. And I really loved those uh, those CDs. I know them from A to Z, uh, backwards, forwards, listen to it all the time. Um, and at a certain point, I was signed to Black Hole Recordings. I uh, signed my first releases there, end of 2003, Travels, Seven Clouds. Um, a remix of Tom TB, Dream Machine, so I was kind of um, getting really getting up to speed uh, with uh, doing productions like that. And I was like, okay, now let's try a bit different, something a bit different. Let's go for this, this Insert Sunrise kind of vibe, a bit more progressive, trans, groovy, uh, leading up to the melody, but just taking the time to really go there. So that was kind of the the concept uh, but um i had another track actually um that nowadays is actually released under another name uh was it alpida yeah so now i have i it, in 2021 it was i think i released as to alpida which has a melody that was actually lifted from an older track i did which was called reflections and it's like a... that was how the way it was going with this kind of lead uh and it also had this kind of kind of groove that uh tales me south also has so actually that track was finished but i wasn't really happy with it and i never sent it to black hole or to any other label but it existed i think i made it at the end of 2003, beginning of 2004. Um, then I got the chance to do uh, lots of tracks for Black Hole because yeah, now suddenly I had uh, Dimitri, who was the A&R manager at the top. At that moment, uh, basically on hop dial, he, could, he would always listen to my tracks. He would send them or give them to Tiesto directly. So it was a great time. It was like I made something and I would in well, it took always, always took some time, but I would get great feedback and usually it was, oh yeah, you're already playing it. So it's like, okay, this is, if I'm going to do the really good stuff, this is the, this is the time for it. Now I have uh, the best opportunity to really launch something uh, that I uh, really believe in myself. Uh, so 
with probably the Reflections track still fresh in my head, I started to make something new and I was playing uh, around, uh, probably I had maybe the same project open or the same synth and it was like... That melody just kind of... It came, I was just playing around, I was like, okay, this sounds... Was very simple, short, but like... Yeah, it sounded really catchy, but also a bit melancholic, uh, trancy, and then I combined that with um, the bassline groove that was instead of going nice, uh, or being on the offbeat or being such a, like a rolling arpeggio bassline, which was used quite a lot at the time. It was just something groovy that was kind of going against the beat, like dun, 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 dun. it bounces a little bit. Uh, it's a kind of a polyrhythm kind of thing. Uh, don't uh, don't judge me if it's the, not 100% the correct in music theory, but I think it's uh, something like that. Um, and those things came together. Uh, so it was basically straight on uh, ding, 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 with the melody. And then I added the chord change. So I followed the melody and I did some, I don't know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a specific, it's, I, I, it, I'm not gonna try to play it because it's uh, too long ago, but there's a specific inversion I played with the chord. Yeah, okay, getting very music technical now, but the way I played the chord and on that switch around, yeah, and also when the progression goes uh, a little bit, a little bit further along with the melody, suddenly lighting was like, it came together. I was like, look at that, goosebumps. This is really something. I think I was I, at, le at least I was like, this is, you know, what I was thinking about. What I, what it reminded me of was a bit of feeling I got when I was uh, listening to, I think it's in Sir Sunrise, three, uh, yeah, for Solar Stone track, Solar Coaster, mm -hmm. which also has this thing, you know, going in the break and you have this melody. <laughs> And it starts to follow, the bass line starts to follow along and it's suddenly, you know, the, the clouds go away yeah. and the, the magic happens. And my track was doing that as well. I was like, this is the same feeling. I was like, this is great. So finished it, made a full track out of it. And, and back in the days, they were long tracks, long built up, really taking my time, go to that break, introduce strings, then you really build up to that moment where the melody comes, comes in the first time, uh, do that chord progression suddenly, where the magic happens, and then just back dropping in the kick, and then I think I repeated it. It was mm -hmm. like back in the day, she just did it on two breaks, crazy yeah. things like that. Nowadays, nobody has time for that, yeah. but it was still uh, possible in 2004. Uh, and it was actually finished quite fast. It was uh, not a very... Uh, um, difficult production process for the rest. It was, the idea was there, I knew what I wanted, so that's uh, how it started. Yeah. And then I sent it to Dimitri. And I didn't hear anything for a month. Oh. Which, afterwards I learned that this is normal, but I was not, uh, I wasn't signed to Black Hole very long yet because it was end of 2003 that I started there and it was, I think, Tales from the South, I was creating it in somewhere the first part of 2004. So it was not summer yet, so nothing. Um, what I didn't know was that it was actually at exactly uh, at the, uh, the week or the weeks that the, uh, Miami uh, Winter Music Conference was going on. So after a long time and I started thinking like, mm, yeah, maybe it wasn't that good. I don't even hear anything like, shall I, shall I call uh, Dimitri or mail Dimitri to check uh, what is going on or is whatever. So I was starting to lose confidence a little bit. Uh, and then he, he called me and he was like, yeah, it's a great track. I just played it on every set since I since he got it on Miami everywhere so we're going to release it uh, on Magic Music so yes that is that's what happened got Magic Music Stace was at, at that 
it still exists, but at that point it was Tess's personal label on Black Hole. Like the tracks that were really uh, the things he played all the time and that were kind of special to him. Um, and he really wanted to promote as this is a Tiesto, uh, a track that you can expect in a Tiesto mm -hmm. track, a uh, Tiesto set. Um, so it was like blown away. I mean, I just started, I, I had already had a, the Black Hole releases, I think at that point, two S2A tracks um, signed and the remix I did for uh, Dream Machine, which was already quite amazing. It was like going really well, but then this magic music thing was suddenly like, whoa. Yeah. Didn't uh, expect, yeah, I mean, it was like oh, really getting recognition from someone who uh, just a few years before I was listening to Chester set to listening to Insert of Sunrise and thinking like, oh, how great would it be if I would be a part of that, uh, not knowing if it was realistic. And certainly it was not only, it was not Insert of Sunrise, it was like magic music. Yeah. It was like his personal stamp of approval, like, okay, this is a great track well done uh, and we're going to push it uh, with all my uh, with my full name behind it mm -hmm. uh, no not just a release on the label but on my personal label. Yeah. and so yeah yeah that's almost all the story maybe well it's not that's how it started so uh, yeah it was and, and do you remember which uh, kind of uh, equipment you used for the track uh yeah so that was um in the early days, well, not very early, I was, I already started producing the uh, end of uh, the 90s, but it was in the early days of my uh, black hole trance years. So it was mostly uh, software that was still, that was possible at the time. It was 2004, so I had a pretty powerful uh, PC that I got uh, not that long before that, a bunch of plugins. Um, I think the lead sound was the uh, VSTi version of the ARP Odyssey. That's a classic synth from the 70s, mono synth. This is a newer version of it. I don't know if you can see it, but um, it's. I'm actually considering of getting the uh, getting the real version myself, just because it's nowadays a bit of a thing I do. Just <laughs> bit of, bit of a collector as well. Um, but that was what I used for the lead sound. Well, at least for the original version. There's another version where uh, things changed a little bit. Um, so that was a plug-in. Um, I also used the uh, Native Instruments Absinthe. That's, uh, I think, the most of the bass groove. Uh, yeah, well, it's you have a bass sound and you have a chord that I play. A kind of plucky thing is that, uh, you know, what is it? You know, here I can't play it with this sound, but that was an, an Absinthe thing, uh, I think. Um, and for the rest, I think I even at that point I still used uh, Reason propeller heads. Reason that was it was possible to not to know to have that as a kind of an equipment rack, mm -hmm. and then rewire it into Cubase, and then have it use it as a virtual studio that way. And I think it was maybe one of the last tracks where I still used that because it, it didn't use a lot of CPU power, but it sounded pretty good. Um, and probably that's where the the beats and some of the other sounds came from. FRS, it's, it's audio effects, so, but it was actually fully done on the computer. Uh, I didn't have a lot of hardware anyways, and in those days, I, 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 the one I had was my master keyboard, but uh, I wasn't using it for the sound, so that was it, I think. Um, was there anything else special? No, I think it's mostly is that ARP Odyssey. That's the key and the absent to those really hack hearted core sounds. And yeah, of course, and the Spectrosonic Atmosphere. Uh, that was a VSTi that was really good at those path sounds. So those are the, yeah, you hear them mostly in the break. Uh, when you, the strings are playing, that's the atmosphere. Pretty, no, not hot. Not a bit, I'm 100% sure that it was the atmosphere. Uh, and for the rest, I think stuff that was available at the time, uh, the thing is, and that's a bit a shame, I still have the project, but I can't uh, open it fully. I can still get the, extract the media and such, but those plugins, they don't work anymore. That's the big shame of uh, the virtual uh, studio stuff is that 
those plugins they don't get updates anymore at a certain point you get a new version of uh, the DAW and, and suddenly things are not compatible anymore and you basically have to find an old computer and an old version of all the software to even get your old tracks to uh, to play yeah. so uh, yeah I wish I kind of made um, full audio stems back in the days nowadays I always do that when I make new tracks I also make sure that I have like oh, real yes. audio tracks so that if something would happen 10 years 20 years later I can still yeah. get those sounds but now I kind of have to recreate it yeah. Uh, yeah. or find a very old computer yeah. but yeah that was the equipment yeah so is there a story behind the title as well tales from the south actually yes uh good question i was i forgot but um yes i was reading the lord of the rings the two towers at that point um actually it, it's a funny story i i got that book years before the movies were a thing and I got the two towers. So for the Lord of the Rings nerds, there are three books. The Fellowship of the Ring, the Two Towers and the Return of the King. The Two Towers is the middle one in a trilogy. And that's the book I got from, from my parents years ago. At, for Christmas, for New Year, I don't know. So in, initially when I had it, it was like, it starts in the middle of the story. Uh, and I didn't understand anything. It was like, who's Gandalf? What is a Hobbit? Where are those two towers? I don't, I don't get it. But eventually, I read it. Uh, unbelievable, unbelievable, true. But I only read the Fellowship of the, the Fellowship of the Ring when I saw the movies. But I already knew the mm -hmm. the second part. Long story short, at a certain point in the two towers, um, at the end of the book somewhere, uh, Sam and Frodo are um, in the they see an army of the Haradrim uh, walking towards Mordor with the big elephants. It's also a scene in the movie. And they get ambushed by the Italian rangers, uh, Faramir. Yeah, I can really nerd here. Um, and at a certain point, there's one of those Haradrim warriors that lies dead there on the ground. In the movie, you can see it, but there's not much uh, going on about it. There, there's not much said about that but in the in the book it goes you go into the mind of Sam who is saying like is this what kind of uh, stories and lies would have been uh, told this these young person young people to uh, be so foolish to march towards war or to fight for Sauron uh, and and then, sort of, and then he says like what kind of tales from the south because they came from the south are still uh, untold mm -hmm. something like that maybe I quote it a bit uh, wrong but it's in that scene of the book that part of the book that chapter where basically tales from the south is literally set and I was like was in my mind that I had such a cool uh, idea of you know the tales from uh, another civilization we don't know much about it the south of course not with this but probably also in sort sunrise in my mind the southern uh, uh, the balearic islands the south of europe i was like tales from the south this is perfect yeah this yeah. track is is like a, a, a story from the southern europe from ibiza for example or something like that uh, so i kind of used that as a title and then I actually used the Tales uh, name for an album as well afterwards mm -hmm. because it kind of always stick with me like yeah. it's a really cool really cool concept well cool or very nerdy <laughs> depends <laughs> I at least I, I like and, and and still so it's it's actually Lord of the Ring I, I used a couple of other Lord of the Rings references in titles here and there because I'm quite a kind of uh, you're a fan. Fan indeed, but uh, that's the that's the most obvious yeah. one, I think. Ah, cool. Yeah, you already mentioned it, but in 2005 you did a new version which is called the Jonas Sturz Revision Flow. Uh, that version was used by Chester on his In Search of Sunrise 5 Los Angeles Mix compilation. And I guess you made that new version especially for the for the compilation then. Yes. So indeed, uh, certainly In Search of Sunrise became a thing again. I didn't know that uh, they were planning to revive the series, but they uh, did in 2005 or 4, I think, originally. That was Insert Sunrise 4, 
which I do have a track on, but that's Palma Solane, which I made with uh, Paul Moulin's Relocate. Um, originally, because I have another S2A uh, track that followed uh, after Tales from the South, Flow. And Flow was also one of those tracks that Tiesto played a lot. And um, I remember Dimitri uh, sending me an SMS like, Oh, Tiesto is playing Flow in, uh, in Russia, Moscow, some me big festival. Everyone goes completely insane. Uh, and uh, a, a, a few weeks later, I saw Dimitri at um, Illusion, Illusion at the Beach. That was a, a festival in Belgium. Um, it's actually one of the one of the few times that I actually met Tiesto himself because for some reason, yeah, he was always somewhere else, uh, yeah. and I was in Belgium. But that that time he was in Belgium, and I just went there. I was talking to all the black hole guys a little bit to taste, but Dimitri told me like, Flo, uh, I, I have something cool to tell you about that. We're going to do a new Insert Sunrise uh, compilation, and Flo will be on it. And I was like. Yes, this is like best night ever. And then months, 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 nothing happening. Uh, and eventually Flow is released, uh, which took a super long time as well. Uh, and kind of, you know, it, it's nothing is happening. Then Dimitri kind of contacts me again. Yeah, okay, yeah, we're doing Sir of Sunrise. Do you maybe have. Uh, I was like, yeah, why are we going to do flow? Yeah, I don't know if we're still doing that, but maybe you have something else. So then I basically messaged Paul. Uh, like, at that, that was the time that intuition already started. I had Castamara and such. So I was working closely together with Paul quite a lot. And I was like, I need to make something. You Do you want to be on Sunrise? Well, let's do it now. So we made Palma Solani really fast. And in like one afternoon, uh, Saturday afternoon, so that's an our story, but then Tales from the South flow. They were played a lot by Tiesto, but not on the compilation. And I think uh, I read an interview years and years ago with Ralphie B, Ralph Barnes of uh, Ralphie B and Midway, which was actually to say the, uh, about the same set. Like I, I had this track, Massive. Tiesto was playing it all the time, but I never got a compilation. Every time I missed the boat somehow. Oh, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I start to recognize this problem. Um, and then in Sir Sunrise 5 was coming quite close afterwards. I was like, okay, good. Uh, and then uh, Dimitri uh, asked me like, okay, now we're going to use Tales from the South again. Well, at least Tiesto expressed interest to, to use the track, but can you make a special version or a new version, uh, especially for the compilation? And I was like, okay, now it's time for the revenge <laughs> of flow. So I made the flow revision. And of course on the CD it says revision flow because for some reason, I don't know how, how this even can be a typo, but it was, it was put on the cover of the CD incorrectly, but it's a lot more logical flow revision. It was the revision I made and I injected a lot of flow. So I used actually samples from uh, flow and I used actually part of the melody of flow in the break of Tales from the South, and instead of the uh, Arp Odyssey lead, I changed it into some more, something guitar-like, a little bit different, and I just made everything a little bit more, um, yeah, well, we were already almost two years, well, well, almost two years after I made the original, um, maybe one and a half year, doesn't matter. Um, so I was, was at least I, I had more stuff, I was gotten a little bit better at producing or knowing what I wanted to do. So I made it a little bit more lush, but in the end, it's still Tales from the South. One of the most important things I did is make it shorter though, because the original is like forever. Apparently we just checked, it's the, my longest track ever yeah, yeah. that I released. And I, I, that's, I think it's true, yeah. I, I, I always thought it was Flow, because Flow was my I go to the toilet track when I was DJing. Just, you know, <laughs> mix it in and then I can go to the toilet, even drink something, talk to someone, maybe call my mom and then, ah, yeah, time to, <laughs> time to mix again. But Tales from the South, the original is indeed, and I think it's, it's well, it is that long because it has the second break. Yeah. Is it necessary? I think nowadays I wouldn't do it like that, but yeah, 
at the time it was still very much acceptable to i mean we were still we were making vinyl so we had enough room you could yeah, yeah. you could put two tracks on each side if they and they could be like 12 minutes maybe 13 minutes i think that was about the max yeah yeah uh, i mean the same push universal nation is a great is a great, great example as well it's like a 12 30 minute yeah, track yeah. the original goes on forever fills one full uh side nowadays with with streaming it's it would be insane to have such a long track because no one is going to listen that long so we cut it short and also the flow revision i simply did the one break and then afterwards uh, when the beat dropped and you have to uh, hold and you know everything everything has played its role it just goes to an outro and you can mix it uh, and for me that's kind of no, that's not true. I made an R version, which is the album version actually, because not that long uh, after that I made my first album, Pour for the Night. And the second CD of the album is a mix of my older tracks up until that point. Well, older tracks, they were all new, but the hit compilation or the hit mix, uh, let's uh, call it like that, and Till From The South was on there as well. And for the album I made a version which is actually a merge of the original which has the ARP Odyssey lead but also uses the flow revision as its base oh, yeah. and has the same build up so there's actually three versions the original which was on the vinyl super long uh, which started it all the insert sunrise 5 version which uh, has all the flow elements and the guitar lead and then the album version which is kind of in the middle of those two yeah. uh, which I don't know I think it's it's, it's okay that's the cool thing about um, about dance music is that you can kind of uh, refresh yourself uh, I think uh, a, a good example is for example Kraftwerk listen to lots of Kraftwerk stuff and they did that with their own tracks quite a few times yeah you can have the, you can check the very old versions from the late 70s 80s the originals but then they made new remixes and a couple of times for some tracks and updating it with new techniques and and you know it, making it a bit shorter or a bit more interesting and actually i also like those new versions just as much sometimes i think like oh yeah but the original is holy you shouldn't touch it mm -hmm. but uh i think i read it maybe i think it was maybe an interview with one of the craftwork guys uh, pro that kind of made me realize like this is electronic music why not i mean it's just like a new interpretation of uh your your original track but it doesn't mean that you deny the original the original is still the way it is it, it's not that we want to forget about it or that it's bad but maybe we have some you have some new ideas now or you and you watch it updated it. yeah indeed and and why not and that's i think tales from the south is one of those tracks where i actually could do that in a very short time and in two years i made three versions yeah. Uh, and yeah uh yeah that's it i think yeah. <laughs> what was the question nobody <laughs> remembers long story so uh, besides tiesto who else was uh, supporting the track um i think armin played it as well um, well, it's, I, I'm pretty sure it was in a state of trance. I'm not sure if he ever played it live, but yeah, it's always really hard to know these things afterwards. Um, for the rest, I'm not sure. I mean, it must have been played by <laughs> our DJ as well. We sold quite a lot of finals, yeah. uh, even. But uh, I don't really have. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, I also wasn't really interested i mean if jester yeah, yeah, was so playing it yeah. and putting it on magic music yeah. and in sir sunrise for me that was yeah. at that moment he was the yeah that was the holy grail yeah, he was the holy grail he was the top of the trance scene the rest was i mean of course it's nice always nice if lots of people play your track but i mean in the end it was that that's where it started it was the yeah, top yeah, of the yeah, mountain yeah, yeah, yeah. um um yes what it uh, uh one of the nice side effects though of tales from the south was that it gave me some um credibility uh to uh do a lot of more to do more things to to you know it started to open doors um 
And the most important door that opened at that point was uh, the intuition door. So the, the last time you were not here, but in my older, other old studio, um, we were talking about Castamara Silent Waves, which was not that long after I did Tales from the South. Certainly, certainly Castamara has a very direct connection to that kind of uh, sound, only there I added a little bit more energy. But it was really because of Tales from the South that Paul uh, and Manuel contacted me like do you maybe want to do something for our new label as well which was yeah of course it kind of escalated quite a lot into i did the first release for the label but it's because of they them hearing a track that they contacted me um otherwise it, i was just someone who did a few minor releases let's say like that on on black hole mm -hmm. uh, and maybe it could have built up a little bit more i mean that was quite doing quite a lot of things but that was really the the first track that was like like a highlight yeah. of a set at chester was um releasing the just be album also around that time and he did a promo event at the Heineken music hall and he dropped that track like in the middle of the set it was broadcasted on uh, dutch national radio i think uh, so the day after i mean a lot of course that uh, in those, those days everyone was downloading those sets sharing them on the internet so on yeah the site just to track list or or the just to website the form that was like a, a mega long thread uh, about all the tracks in it and it was like really people wondering like what is this track and like it was really uh, so some yeah, some hype some hype around it. it was like the first time that it happened uh, with uh, the track i made before that i was just some unknown unknown guy from belgium who released some tracks uh, and whatever just one of the uh, the background noise in the scene mm -hmm. and suddenly i was uh, in, the, in on the foreground yeah. uh, of the trance scene which was really uh, special and i pretty good things happened indeed the doors opened intuition could do quite a lot of remixes uh, and yeah it's really the start of, of everything yeah. that happened afterwards uh, um so yeah great so even just if if only Tiesto would have played it and no one else, it was already enough yeah, yeah, to do yeah. that. But I think it was, um, yeah. For the rest, we'll have to find old track list. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, you already mentioned it uh, in the summer of 2020. Uh, I did an interview with you about your track Costa Lara. Uh, first of all, a lot of people did enjoy the cameo of your cat in the video. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you moved to a new place, and we are recording this interview in your brand new studio. Uh, what are the biggest changes compared to your old studio? Bes besides the fact that there's a lot of more space for me to sit. But... <laughs> and yeah, so yeah, it's all bigger. Um, the the difference was this is uh, the house is a lot bigger. There are no neighbors uh, sharing walls with us, so I can make a lot more uh, noise. Uh, uh, and the studio itself changed almost completely. Back in 2020, uh, I wasn't doing that much production work, anyways, anymore. It was actually thanks to uh, seeing their reactions uh, on the interview that I started to realize like how stupid I was to not keep on doing the to, to keep doing this and start doing that a lot more. It was getting really lots of positive uh, energy from just seeing the reactions and I was like, okay, let's do this again. So I um, started making new tracks and then um, I, also started well i revived my old youtube channel actually um and because of that i started to um get some more hardware again i i had one of the old synthesizers uh, that i had since the late 90s it was sitting in the corner on the previous interview i just i restored it put it back on its proper place and then it kind of got some friends. It started with a small keyboard and then another one, another one. I started doing videos about it, but I also started using them, of course, in my tracks. And uh, suddenly my studio uh, changed from uh, pure software based, which I used uh, from, I think, 2003 until that point, 2020 is my main setup. 
because before that I used hardware actually, but that was the really early days and wasn't that not that impressive as this uh, setup. Mm. So it started to get a little bit cramped. <laughs> so already there, I had a lot of stuff, but it was like, yeah, um, it's starting to get really difficult. And then we, we moved, we, we bought the, this house and I basically uh, told my girlfriend, okay, let's do this, but this the biggest room, I'm going to claim it. <laughs> That's going to be a studio because, I mean, I need to put it somewhere. Uh, uh, so Angie was okay with that. So this room was uh, one of the first ones we renovated. We put in a new floor and we uh, changed a few things, although it's still, it's always a work in progress, but you know, just made sure it was kind of useful, usable as a studio. And then uh, for the first time, Ever, I have uh, the possibility to go around my equipment and to plug in cables, change cables, and a lot more room. So more synthesizers came in. <laughs> I mean, the mountain is growing and there's a small mountain and on the other side we have stuff. Um, and it really uh, changed my way of working, uh, not only for what I do for YouTube, but uh, also my own productions are now for the first time since the early 2000s, I started using hardware again, and um, it focuses, it, it makes me focus a lot more. There's not that, the problem with software is that you can do everything. It's really great, but the, there's a bit the paralysis of having too many options. With a, a setup like this, I basically have to limit myself a little bit uh, because okay, you can't use all those synths at the same time. Uh, it's one sound per instrument, basically. It's not completely true, but to simplify it. So it's like, okay, let's make a track and I have a bass, that's that one. I have this lead and some strings, a bit extra, a little bit like that. And then less is more, you know, it's, it's I don't have to start wondering like oh what shall i use today i just can have an idea i start making music and it's already there i can just play this play this all this but then there you know um you're making music before you know you have lots of uh lots of tracks going on and you're you're there for me i thought it would be slower because it's more difficult because you know you have lots of extra technical uh factors to think about but in practice it's a, it's a lot faster so this studio is now actually the studio that what would have been the studio of my dreams in the late 90s when i started out to have this stuff would have been amazing the thing is i've been in those studios mm -hmm. when I, I was working on my first release uh, silver tear so deep was in 1999 i was in the studio of uh, the producers behind uh, Ian van Daal, uh, Christophe Schanses, Erik van Spouwen, and Erik had his, his studio at home. And it was a bedroom that was, well, bedroom, I think it used to be a bedroom. It was a room that was twice this size and you could barely fit in there because there was so much equipment that synthesizers and modules and mixers, everything crammed full, he had everything. And at that point I was a bit overwhelmed by it although very it was very cool to work there but i wasn't really like using it to its fullest potential uh, also back in the days i've been to other studios like for example the studio that was uh, uh used by uh the rick and the boy tommy for their their jump records in the late 90s i've also been working there on a track uh, that was never released but also, you know, all the, all, you had all the classic sins there that nowadays I would like, I would love to have them here, but now the prices are going through the roof. And it was just all sitting there, mega big uh, Tannoy monitor speakers. And I was like, not really appreciating the chances we, we got. I mean, the, the, the luxury we had by getting all that equipment. I was actually basically like, uh, yeah, but I can't use this home. I need. It. I let's ho hope. I hope there's a software version of this. <laughs> but now, finally, after all these years, I think also yeah, because I 
got, of course, uh, because of working in IT, I had uh, a little bit more disposable income. And also because of uh, the unexpected success of the YouTube channel, I actually uh, started to earn money with music again for uh, the first time in years. <laughs> so it kind of started growing and uh, it's kind of um, now it's a feedback loop. You know, I have these things, but it's not like I'm not collecting them to have a museum of synthesizers. I get specific synths because I have a very strong connection in them or because I have a very specific idea what I want to use with it, uh, what I go to use them for. And then I have this rule. I always uh, tell my girlfriend, they have to earn, they have to pay themselves back. Yeah, 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 yeah. So before I, I, I add another layer to the mountain here, they need to be used actually in, in actual released music or for the YouTube channel or something like that. Uh, and it kind of, you know, makes suddenly there's this the factory, uh, but you know, it's it's like a snowball effect. It, I started to make more and more and faster and easier. And because uh, if you're doing lots of production work again and making lots of music, it starts to become this reflex again. And nowadays I can do tracks in one day, like back in the days. It's like, but then with a lot more complicated yeah. uh, stuff. So yeah, the, the studio, it's not only a lot of equipment, but it's really it, 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 the, the, extension, the extension of what happened in my mind. Yeah. It's, I was like, now to the chance, the second brat, now let's produce like I would have liked to do it when I started out in the late 90s. Now I have the option, now I have a room, now I have some money to spend, now I have some contacts. Uh, and I have a way to get my music there. It's not all, I'm not an, a young noob anymore of 17 years old mm -hmm. who just tries to find his way that I know what I'm doing now. So now let's enjoy it and really relive that. Not only relive it, but then just, um, yeah, use the use the old sins like the, for, that were used in the trans classics and try to use, try to do something new with it or get new synths because there's great new stuff nowadays and just see what happens. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, so there's actually new music coming out as well, right? Uh, quite a lot indeed. Yeah, um, yeah uh, the first thing that will happen and probably already is uh, out when this goes live is um, Solis. It's a track, it's on, under my own on on name, Jonas Teur, which is also right, quite a long time ago that I used it, but I'm going to use it at my main focus cam. Solis is made especially for the new Insert of Sunrise compilation. It's number 19 already. Um, Daniel Wanderoy is doing, so it's a three CD uh, compilation. Yeah, there's actually a CD, but it's also on Spotify, don't worry. Um, there are three mixes. Daniel Wandro is doing one of them and he asked me, can you maybe do something uh, that I can use? So I was like, okay, sure. Okay, for instance, a front right. Of course, yeah. I, I'm like, okay, for e no problem. But just, uh, it, it's always a fun challenge. Uh, I, I made this track Solace, which is indeed uh, a bit of my old s 2 a Jonas Steer style, but with a more modern twist. Um, Nowadays, a lot of people call this stuff melodic techno. For me, it's tra trans. Is, I mean, trans techno is the same genre. Trans is the subgenre of techno, anyways. Um, fight me if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's, let's see what happens in the it comments. With that. But um, so it's a bit, and that's it's, it's groovy, but also very melodic uh, and quite deep. So that's going to be, well, it will be out when you're watching this. Um, it will also get a separate release uh, in the beginning of 2024. Um, and I think there will be another remix uh, next to that as well, which is also a bit in the same. Also melodic techno, uh, didn't hear it yet. It's yeah. it's still a production, uh, but what I've heard from the guys who are doing it, it co could be very, very cool. Can, um, you, can you already mention who it is or is that? Uh, no, it, it's actually, it's a new project. It, it's uh, some some uh, guys from Greece that Daniel knows that actually didn't release that much yet. Uh, wow. And are going to do some things for his uh, Elbida label. And uh, he was like, is it cool if they try to remix this? And I was like, 
did, what did they what is the kind of music they made and I got a few of their uh, tracks and uh, sounds really good so like really really good stuff so um, I'm very interested in uh, what the remix will be but also the original will be there <clears throat> and then um, which is kind of cool on the other uh, ESOS uh, mix so there are three of them uh, and the uh, um, Ian, Ian of Iron Bluestone. Ian Bluestone. Ian Bluestone is doing one of them, and he uh, actually added, he put uh, Jonas Teur second turn on there, a new uh, remix. Uh, but another one I made myself. Actually, it was kind of uh, uh, unexpected surprise. I got contacted by Armada a few months ago. Like, we have this new second turn remix. What do you think of it? I was like, okay, sounds cool, but what is what is the idea? Like, oh yeah, they're asking something for asking if uh, for they want to have an option on it for insert sunrise i like insert sunrise i was already doing nar oh, like okay <laughs> apparently <laughs> parallel things are happening so indeed it's um i need to oh i need to look it up um start start you have to help me out here yeah. i'm going to i'm going to uh sheet and look at that phone because i actually yeah. have the i have a track list uh here so Ian Bluestone made the mix. Um, ah yes, Adam Stark. Adam Stark. Adam Stark remixed the uh, second turn. He probably did it also especially for Ian. Uh, and I kind of got in know about it indirectly, but that's how it goes sometimes in the music yeah, yeah. industry. You, things happen and you, not everyone informs you immediately, but I, well, now I I knew it uh, in yeah. time, and of course I was cool with it. So uh, it's um, it would be number seven and eight of my appearances on In Surf oh, Sunrise. Nice. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I have the record. Uh, I used to have the record back in the days uh, when we are when we were at number nine or something. Mm. But now we have ten more CDs, oh, yeah. so I don't know yet. But let's say I've been quite. Well, uh, well, quite closely connected to the Insert <laughs> Sunrise series, so that's going to happen. And uh, next to that, that's going to be released on the 8th of December, um, is uh, on our new Jonas Turf track released on Black Hole, and that is in the genre that I'm going to call techno trance. Find me again. Um, so it's something that has already gone on for a couple of years. What you see, the techno scene really embraced the old school trance sound again, which is, I think is one of the best things that could happen in the last few years, uh, because great sounds that kind of got um, left under the dust of times. Uh, and of course the trance scene still keep, keep uh, is, is going on, but I think most of the trance that was released in the, let's say last 10 years is very much focused on a certain uplifting sound from the the 2000s or a bit after that which it's fine if you like it but for me it's a bit enough is enough i've heard it i know for me those days were great when it was happening where you had guriella and fairy system have uh, great tracks but keep on doing that same thing forever i, I don't know I, it was never something i would I was interested in so that's why i never really made tracks in that direction although there were people asking for it there were actually remixes for uh, customales for example being unofficially remixed in that style two times already i think uh, um, but now suddenly well not now a few years ago it started you have techno djs and i was r listening to Whatever I said, I don't know if it was Tomorrowland or something. It was like, this is a trance track. <laughs> it's just, they're just playing trance. This is what we used to, it, this is what I used to listen to in the night, in the nineties. Well, what the hell, what is, what is going on? It was certainly, they were playing old, uh, yeah. And it, one of the thing, one of the turning points was, I think the Universal Nation. No, no, not Universal Nation. It was another push track, um, Till We Meet Again, I think. Or Strange World, that was it. Strange World, the Joy Houser remix. And suddenly it's this old school trance track, great track original by um, by Mike, that was back as a major 
club festival hit and, and not like just um, using a small snippet and then go back to techno now like really like embracing the trance of it uh, but then just yeah it's it's pretty pounding uh, uh, hard stuff but it is in my opinion pure trance once again trance for me is a subgenre of techno so all trance is techno anyways and apparently nowadays suddenly DJ started to realize it so uh, I've already had it in my mind to maybe do something like that as well for a, a couple of years already and I started experimenting in that direction um, but I got sidetracked a couple of times but then not that long ago I came up with uh, a track Night Tremors so that's a new that's a new Jonas Steel that will be released on 8th December and that's it has a bit of this 90s, not only trance, but bit of even the kind of club vibes. It has this uh, organ uh, bass in there uh, that has 90s uh, vibes going on. And then this big thundering uh, kick, uh, lots of acid sounds. But also in the break, trance and uh, nice paths and, and melodies, so it's a little bit of everything, but in a way that yeah, it, it brings together the, all the things that I like in a nice energetic package. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very curious what it will, what it will do. I have no idea. It's really long ago that I've made uh, that I've released harder tracks. I've done this before, though. By the way, I've released a track with Paul uh, Mulans years ago, Nasty, uh, Nasty yeah. which was actually picked up by a. Uh, Joey Biomechanica uh, back in the days, like really hard uh, dance, hard trance stuff. Uh, no, not even hard trance, I mean, what was his style? Like? It was proper hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was also like a 1 or 40 BPM pounding track. I've, uh, I've even done uh, jump style stuff longer ago before I did trance. Uh, so for me, it's I'm not a stranger to making this a bit more harder uh, tracks and even even things like flow and night shift uh, which i did under the fable uh, alias was also always with with techno in mind because mm -hmm. since forever well even in the days that i was doing like tales from the south i was doing all this nice melodic trance when i was going out myself i would love to go to uh, events like isle of techno which was in belgium uh, a big event uh, in those uh, those years in Kent and just you know go check out sets by yours for or uh, Dave Clark all that kind of stuff I love I l really love the energy and the, the bit different way so it's it's really cool to kind of start to uh, do that techno stuff as well and like release it under my main project but Will it work or not? I don't know. I've made quite a lot of more tracks like that. That uh, yeah, I can also already say that I did a remix for Phantom Manor, uh, Phantom Manor Mark Norman uh, classic, which is also a bit in that style. I don't know, not, not sure when it will be released, but it will also probably be in a month or two, something like that. Uh, working on some uh, um, collaborations with other people that are also in that vibe. So I'm really. I really believe, uh, or at least I hope, I believe that it, it, it could amount to something, but yeah, time will tell, of yeah. course. But most important is go to Spotify or YouTube and listen, at least check it out and we'll see if you like it. But for the people who really don't like the pounding stuff, there's indeed the Solace track, which is a bit the opposite. It's groovy and melodic and nice and slow. Uh, in sort of sunrise vibes and I think that's what it's gonna be now it's all the same name Jonas Steur is my main project but I have the Estuera side which is let's let's call it the in sort of sunrise vibes melodic techno uh, melodic trance but not nothing too uplifting just nice groovy and vibey and then on the other side the more dance floor uh, oriented stuff which is going to be pro probably uh, evolving into more and more techno stuff uh, but I try to well I'm not going to forget trance at all I think it can be combined perfectly well but yeah it's it's like back in the late 90s you had hard trance 
before it was tech trends because tech trends is a little bit of a different thing in my mind at least i'm going to that's why i call this techno trance it's a bit like late night late 90s or, or mid 90s hard trance combined with modern techno and modern production techniques and it is a bit retro and modern at the same time uh well you know what the most important thing is i like it myself so i hope some more people do as well uh and otherwise uh, doesn't matter at least i had fun yeah <laughs> You already mentioned it. You also became very active on your YouTube channel again. Um, what do you exactly post on your channel? Um, so yeah, originally uh, it was intended as a way to promote the new releases. Uh, in 2020, I signed some new tracks to Black Hole. Uh, it was s 2 Umbra was the first of those. And then I had Elpida, Anafola. I had a kind of a series. I, had, I basically signed a bunch of tracks at the same time. I was like, let's try it push a story like that but i wasn't really active anymore on social media uh, and i had the idea like i maybe could do some making of videos because well if you didn't realize yet i'm a peculiar studio music nerd no way I love to <laughs> talk about and endlessly talk about how to how it's made and what it did and what what other people's did and what kind of synthesizers were used it's for me it's one of my big passions so it's like okay let's do a video uh, mm -hmm. in that style first a making of of umbra so i already kind of figured out like okay how is this done nowadays and i filmed myself a little bit and i captured the screen and then got this uh, started kind of relearned myself the video editing stuff i kind of did it in the past but never that serious so that was made and i was like yeah but it's too soon the release is still a few months away so let's maybe already get the chat warm up the channel the channel a little bit just to have some content uh, go around so that is not only like oh yeah here here is this guy again posting for the first time in uh eight years and it's immediately oh yeah you're listening to a new yeah that it's like big like it's only a commercial promotion channel i was like no 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 let's we can do more i can maybe talk so about some other music production stuff as well it's could be interesting right so i made a couple of videos like that uh in the beginning it was going slow i mean it was i, I got views i got some subscribers uh but uh, you know at a certain point i got to do the 1000 subscribers and i got we get monetized you need i think you needed this many hours or thousand four thousand hours i think something like that and 1000 subscribers now the rules are different again but that was what you need so that was my goal like oh it would be cool if i could get monetized maybe i could get a few co a couple of euros uh it's just a nice extra but it's mostly for me it's fun to do and it's a way to uh be active in my studio without immediately having the pressure of having of needing to do releases and remixes and you know that's a different kind of uh energy just relaxed things that i 100 percent like to do myself and if someone else likes it fine with me if they don't i had fun um and then the algorithm <laughs> found me <laughs> and suddenly it was like the graph was going up and up and up. It was crazy. I had like suddenly there were a couple of videos that got over 100,000 views. Subscriber count was rising. Um, and yeah, it, certainly in the, the beginning I was, I had a bit of a plan and I made a new video every week. It was a lot of work actually. Nowadays I don't do it like that anymore, but because otherwise I would have burned out already. But it was a bit the plan to let's uh, keep trying at least a few months and see where what happens. So I had quite a lot of videos in a short time uh, about all kinds of things. First, it was quite, quite was was like about, for example, a specific synthesizer. I I think I started with the Roland MC303 because that was the first groove box synthesizer that i had and i had a, made a video about how i repaired it because that was what i had to do first because it was actually broken and talking a bit about the history and then making a few tracks with it and that resonated i made a video about a very old uh, 
a small toy Casio keyboard I used to have and I really actually had to buy it uh, from uh, Reverb because my original one I couldn't find it anymore <laughs> so I bought it from Reverb and used it for the video that was fun um, I made a video that was like a bit maybe the, the, I thought uh, something like Blake Beatty like famous synth sounds of the 80s and 90s and I was basically going through the synthesizer that were used in the 80s and the 90s uh, in famous hits and that they most of the time lots of times they use a preset sometimes it's really like the first sound you hear when you uh, um, when you power it on and that's like they made a big hit with it I was like it would be cool to have a video about it that is a bit more like dance oriented but because there were videos like that but it's usually always about the 80s uh, stuff and I love 80s music but I'm not that very well I'm not that first in it I mean I was a bit too young when that all was going on uh, but the 90s stuff that's I'm an encyclopedia for that so figured out okay the power of American Natives that's a wave station preset um, plastic dreams ah oh, that's a TXA1Z um, you have for core the JP8000, 8080, that's the super tra super saw uh, the, the trans stuff uh, and more things like that. The Alpha Juno that I have here, it's the, the typical Dominator uh, Gabber lead. So that was that video I made and suddenly that totally blew up. I think it's now it's starting to get close to 1 million views. Still, still gathering views every day for crazy and because of that it started youtube started recommending my other videos as well and um i got the cork m1 which is a late 80s synthesizer that is probably most well known for um not only the choir sounds but mostly well known for the house piano and the house organ think robin s show me love it's that it's a preset you can it's it's like you go to i'm rich i'm just gonna do it so so i put that in the video uh and some more things like that of course properly played properly filmed took off because I had that, that synthesizer, I was like, okay, now let's create an old school 90s, early 90s house track and just make a video about that. So that's what I did. And these things, people start, uh, apparently uh, really love to watch those, not only because of the technical stuff, but also because in the end, I put on the, put, always put a full track. Yeah, the finished product. Yep. Yeah. I make, that's, that's what, so that was really the concept that started there and create a track trying to be as close as possible to how it would have been done in the in the early 90s or late 90s at the period that the track was made make a full track like that really do it properly do my best to make it a really good good music figure out in the meantime how it actually has to be done because i mean i used to make a lot of trance and techno but didn't do early 90s house or I never did drum and bass or big beat or speed garage uh, or gabber <laughs> hardcore stuff I figured out how does these tracks work it's basically it's like a few weeks of research listening making a Spotify playlist of all these classic tracks in a specific genre and like really absorbing it trying to figure out what did they use how are they using it what is the history behind uh, some of these tracks and then creating that but not like copying it but like putting myself in the mindset of that time and then just make a track like I would be one of the producers uh, uh, from those days and then that's the end of the video so I don't know there's quite a lot of people who just skip to that part and I always make a bit of a video clip there which is also kind of has some winks and, and easter eggs about the period that the track was uh, that that style was popular and yeah it really became a format that is now i still uh am doing new videos about i did 
90s house, big beat. I can think Fat Boy Slim, Chemical, Board, Chemical Brother style, drum and bass, hardcore, oh, yeah. Thunder Dome <laughs> hardcore, which was really great to do and which is actually a very popular video, amazing. Um, old school trends as well, of course, I had to do the old school. I tried this one of them. I think the jar I've revisited the most, of course, because it's kind of uh, playing uh, yeah. a home game. Um, what else? Uh, and, and, and Speed Garage, uh, lots of things. Still have quite a lot on the, on the list. On the list. Um, although if you have suggestions, always welcome to leave them on my channel. Um, and because of the reach of the videos, I started to get contacted by all kinds of people actually, because it depended a little bit. Sometimes it's drum and bass people, sometimes it's people that are into uh, the hardcore scene. There, it, sometimes it was uh, just like the, I think I did also a video about old school rave. Suddenly I uh, got to know that there's lots of people still very passionate about it and making new releases with those typical old school prodigy rave breakbeat mm -hmm. stuff. Very interesting and very cool to talk to all those people and and sometimes got some opportunities. I did some remixes that came out of it. For example, I did a video about French House, Daft Punk, early Daft Punk style. Really took off well. I got I, I got someone contacting me, like contacting me, like say, can you do a remix for me? French House style. I was like, why not? <laughs> it's like so such a different uh, uh, thing next to what I used, yeah. what I was used to in the trance scene. What I uh, suddenly I got all kinds of side channels that that gave me yeah uh, new challenges, yeah. new opportunities. And then, uh, also very interesting, I started to get contacted by uh, some companies that are uh, active in the music production uh, industry. Think the Yamaha, Roland, Steinberg. Uh, I use their products all the time and I, they wanted to do some promoted things, sponsored deals. So that's also something that became a part of the channel. I, don't like to just randomly promote whatever Norwich VPN or something. They're not sponsoring this video. Um, but if it's something that is relevant to the for a channel, for the viewers of the channel, I don't mind yeah, that kind of. Uh, and it's gave me interesting opportunity. I mean, for example, recently I got a new version of Cubase. I I'm, I already I buy Cubase new versions since more than 20 years. And now Steinberg starts send, sending them to me. It's, it's like a completely new window to the music industry. Our door is maybe better opened for me. I was I knew about the uh, the part where we did releases and publishing and blah blah, but the the part where there's you know the the the, the actual uh, um, companies who make the products that we used to create music. I didn't know. I mean, I never had anything to do with those, and suddenly, those are contacts that uh, just popped up yep. all, all because of the YouTube channel. So it really completely missed its goal. It, I didn't really use it to promote new releases. Actually, it kind of delayed some of the new releases because I had so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I was spending so much time to do YouTube videos that I kind of didn't do many new original productions for a while uh, and yeah it, it, it was actually at a point that I think if I really kept on pushing and do videos every week I could maybe almost do it as a maybe a bit close to full-time thing oh, wow. it started to it at a certain point it was going really well but it was too much I mean it was too much work to do a video every week and it was like the fun is going to get go out of this let's Slow down. Slow down a bit. Also because we uh, bought this house and we had to renovate and move and yeah. lots of millions of things had to be uh, done. So I also didn't have that much time anymore. Well, my free time was kind of suddenly uh, quite precious. So I slowed down a bit and now I do a video maybe every few months. Yeah. When I do it, I really go for it. I, I went even go way more crazy than I used to do in the early days. Then I was like, okay, this sounds close enough. Now I want to do a track that if you put it in a playlist of uh, the genre I'm creating, 
you shouldn't know that it was that it's like a new, it's new yeah yeah i think for for example the speed garage uh, uh, stuff i i did i it, i think it will would pass that test it's yeah. like it's almost <laughs> Like the, the 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 new tracks you're making, like it, are they also Spotify or somewhere else? Um, so for what I do for a YouTube channel, um, if it doesn't use anything that is like uh, copyright, copyright protected, protected, but usually it's not, I put them on my Bandcamp. So there's a Bandcamp uh, a page that is especially for those tracks where they get the, you can buy them uh, or, or stream them there. Spotify, I've been thinking about it. Could be cool, but not sure yet if I will do that. It might happen. Yeah. Um, because I also don't want to kind of merge the Estuera of YouTube, that who is making classic 90s styles for fun. Yeah. I don't want to mix it up too much with the Estuera. Uh, that is my making my own original music. Yeah. It's the same person, and there's actually certainly connections you might hear if you listen to the new tracks, because of course. It, I get influenced by the things I do. If I, I nowadays I know how to make drum and bass records like old school mm -hmm. and, or or jungle tracks like the, they used to do in the '90s. Well, that's a production trick that is here forever. Yeah. So if I'm now working on music, I maybe could sneak in something like that. Uh, same with all the the garage house stuff, the the hardcore stuff. Even it's actually quite useful for when you're doing techno because those old school harder sounds are actually very uh, much in vogue again so i have them under my hands here mm -hmm. it's like <laughs> the synthesizers are there so uh, it really kind of starts to become one big uh, uh, what is it yeah it's it's really influencing each other in, yeah, in, yeah. Several, in several ways probably what i will do now is also do some new videos maybe about the techno trance stuff yeah. because that's actually quite there's still there's so, so, some very specific production techniques how you make those thundering kicks roll mm -hmm. the way they do that are probably interesting to do video about and then maybe it starts to come back oh yeah a little bit but the actual point of making the channel indeed um but i think i will just keep on going with that it's for me it's just so much fun uh to uh do the things that when i was a young teenager i was listening of course i was listening to the radio i heard all those styles the old tracks that are in the 90s genres that i produce uh, now for the videos and then i was like oh it would be so cool to make that yourself but there's no well you wouldn't do make a track like that to release i mean there's it's pretty pointless there's not always any markets for it anyway mm -hmm. so why would you do it but now i can do it and you can actually get quite a lot of people to watch it and like it. It's it's amazing. Yeah. It's uh, and it was one of the best happy accidents uh, of the last few years. And it really also totally kickstarted me to uh, make new productions uh, for Jonas Stud has to add as well because I think I became a lot more uh, rounded as a producer because of, I had to learn new things yeah because that's one of the things that is i think it's in every uh everything in life if you're doing the same thing all the time you st you get probably you get good at it but you kind of start yeah. to get a little bit tunnel vision you get maybe get a bit yeah. bored as well uh you don't expand your horizon anymore but by forcing myself to explore uh the genres that i've never produced myself i have to yeah, let go my typical uh, bag of tricks yeah. and add new tricks to, uh, to the bag and suddenly I discovered that my bag is way too small and I had to get a bit yeah. bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suddenly it's, it's for me, it's, uh, th that's the biggest difference now. I think without exaggerating, if it's something in, the, in dance in general, if you say, Jonas, make a track that it isn't that genre, next week you will have it yeah i i kind of found a way to it, how, how i i found a way that is very efficient to analyze uh, something to really 
extract all the useful bits of information of it and then know how to put it together. It's like how you suddenly that it's like a car mechanic that can you know disassemble a car and put it back together and you're like how does he even know where everything fits? At a certain point it's kind of it clicked in my mind like ah oh, this is how you can do this in a very efficient way and it usually works. It's, Unless you go way, way outside my comfort zone, then it's maybe difficult. But anything that has peats and is produced with in a studio like this, I yeah. think I can probably get a passable result uh, pretty fast. Which is very convenient when you're making music, new music. Yeah. Because now I can, uh, what was a f super big challenge years ago, when someone would say, yeah, this is nice, Jonas, but can't you have this kick, for example, sound a little bit more like this in sorts popular track of the time. And I was like, yeah, but I don't know how they did that. And I don't know. now I, I kind of, you know, put on, yeah. put on the, the, the magic, uh, put on the, 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 the special X-ray, whatever, hearing, and like, ah, oh, yeah, that's how they do that kick. And then, and, you, and suddenly it's a new uh, trick in your back and you can make tracks like, okay, they have to, kick that the late the AR manager wants and suddenly you get from mm, it could have been almost released like that it's yeah we're there um so yeah it's i never expected that it would uh would kick off would, like that would kick off like that but and that it had would have this kind of effect yep. uh because i thought it would be a completely separate thing and just yeah. Maybe a few thousand views here and there, but it uh, really uh, kind of started the second part of my uh, my music career. Well, it's really good, good for you. Yeah. Really great. Yeah. Well, speaking of your music career, uh, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Oh, yes. Um, grayer, and I admit I still hope I have my... <laughs> and actually, I hope to be here, because this is uh, this house. I've already put so much work in it. Uh, I don't plan on uh, moving again. Maybe a bit nicer. Maybe a few more synthesizers. <laughs> um, but ten years is such a long time. Yeah. I think I, I, for the time being, I want to keep on producing. Want to make uh, some more content for YouTube. Want to release some more tracks uh, in. For example, the techno trance stuff, but also the more melodic uh, trance stuff, uh, because why not? Maybe one of the things I might try, it's at least it's an idea that's slowly forming in my head, but I don't know yet, is maybe to also release some things completely on my own. Um, so have a kind of label that is just for my own stuff. Yeah. And then pre release some things that are really different more experimental you know maybe like more ambient uh, things that kind of stuff i look for it i'm a big synthesizer nerd uh, it will be something with synths but maybe not that much dance floor oriented um but i don't know it, it kind of has to happen uh, yeah and 10 years yeah what is it then the 2003 yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I just hope to still have, uh, still be making music in yeah. my studio and having as much as fun as I as I do now. That's the most important, I guess. Maybe there will, would have, will have been more hits, maybe it will still be the same as it is now, I don't care. I, it, the fun will be had, uh, I'm enjoying myself and there's all, at least a few people who I can share it with who probably also enjoy it, so what more yeah. do I want? Yeah. What more can I ask for? Well. Thanks a lot for your time and good luck with everything. Thank you. All right, that was it. This week's Raw, the story behind Estuera and Tales from the South, my interview with Jonas Steur. Jonas, thanks a lot for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to give this video a like, leave a comment in the comment section below, and very important, make sure to subscribe. Also make sure to click the bell button because then you will get a notification the next time a new vlog is online. And I did another interview with Jonas and that one he will share the story behind Fall to Pieces, a beautiful vocal trance classic which he did together with Jennifer Renee. That interview will be online in a couple of weeks so stay tuned. 
Plus, in the past, I already did another interview with Jonas. In that one, uh, we spoke about his track Castamara. You can already find that interview on my channel, so make sure to check it out. Once again, thanks for watching, and until next time, bye bye.